welcome everybody to this installment of the Accelerator series, where we'll, we will be talking about they said what, um, and provide you tips for avoiding headaches at the TTAB. Um, again, as Joan said, I'm Deborah Pollock Milgate. Um, I've practiced in IP litigation for about two decades, and I'm also the co-chair of the European Practice Group at Barnes and Thornburg. Um, as some of you may remember, back in May, um, we spoke to you about the unitary patent that has since come into play and global litigation considerations, as well as export controls all with the goal of alleviating some of the headaches we as practitioners experience in uh, juggling the legal considerations of doing business, the myriad legal considerations there are. Um, so today we're going to focus some more on alleviating those headaches, um, but this time with the emphasis on trademarks and the TTAB. So I am excited today to introduce you to a few of my other colleagues. Um, who have expertise in this area. And first and foremost, I'm going to start with Linda Kuzma. Um, Linda has decades of experience in this area, first in private practice, and then, I know everyone wants to hear about this, as a TTAB judge. Um, as such, because of that unique background, she offers unique insights into securing trademark protection and obtaining favorable outcomes in the federal court. Um, the USPTO, and of course, the TTAB. Um, Linda is also an author in trademark topics and a sought after speaker. She's presented to all of the organizations that we know so well, where I don't even have to explain the acronyms, INTA, PLI, ABI, ABA, AIPLA, and I could go on and on. So I know everyone is looking forward to hearing from her today. Um, Michelle Michael, um, is in our DC office. Michelle herself brings more than a decade of experience practicing in trademark and advertising law, copyright, and unfair competition matters. She routinely represents clients' interests in a variety of jurisdictions in the U.S. courts, the USPTO, and the TTAB, and she serves as uh, co-chair of Barnes & Thornburg's Advertising and Marketing Practice Group. We're really looking forward to hearing from her today, her perspective on the TTAB proceedings, particularly against the backdrop of what Linda has to say as well. And then last but certainly not least, Corinne Conway. She's a more recent addition to Barnes and Thornburg and we couldn't be happier to have her. She's a magna cum laude graduate of the University of Illinois College of Law and she's an associate who's 100% engaged in trademark and copyright matters. Corinne will share some observations on recent case law. Questions, everyone, if you have them, please drop them in the chat and I will try to weave them in as we go along. Um, with that, I wanna go right over to you, Linda, um, and just try to lay the framework for this in general. Could you, first of all, just explain to our listeners today what is the TTAB and what, is, what jurisdiction does it have? What cases does it decide? Well, the TTAB is an administrative tribunal of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. It, it hears appeals from the refusal of registration, also two new proceedings called expungement and reexamination proceedings, uh, also trademark opposition and cancellations and concurrent use proceedings. That, that's the subject matter of what the TTAB hears. Great. And so in terms of, um, to, to that sounds like a, a lot, although it also sounds sort of limited at the same time. In, in terms of, um, Michelle, from your perspective and, you know, looking at um, a, a litigation strategy overall in the trademark realm, uh, where, when do you find it useful to move forward in the TTAB? Um, versus federal federal court. What are some considerations you look at? Sure. Thanks, Deborah. Um, so, you know, there, as Linda said, the TTB is really, it's a limited in what it can do, right? So, you know, it has authority to decide whether a trademark application should be granted and registered and whether a trademark registration should be canceled. So it's it's very limited. There's no injunction, no damages, no attorney's fees. So when you're considering whether to be bring, you know, your case before the TTAB or um, before a district court, the first consideration is, you know, what are my goals? What am I 
like it's strategically, what is your desired outcome? If your desired outcome as party A is to stop party B's use of the mark, then go to court, right? Yet that's where you can get an injunction. Um, but if there are, if the consideration is, well, you know, party B filed a trademark application and um, I don't want that to be registered, then, you know, narrowly you look at it. Okay, I can file a trademark opposition. Of course, that's looking at it really black and white. And um, there are times when you can only be before the board, when you can only be before the court. And there are, I'd say many in my experience, um, I'm looking strategically at both. So I'll just give a quick overview too of like when you would only have the opportunity to be before the board. Um, if a party has not filed a trademark application or doesn't have a registration to be canceled and they have you know, nothing before the PTO for you to consider, it's all common law use, you're, the board is not even a consideration for, for you and your client. So um, you'd be looking at a district court suit or you know other, other enforcement efforts outside of the TTAB. Um, but if a party has filed, for example, an intent to use application and has not made any use in commerce, you might think, okay, I can think about, is it the TTAB or the district court? But there's been no use in commerce yet. It, they've only filed an intent to use application. So that really your only jurisdiction there is the board because no use has been made in commerce. So you can't argue or make an allegation of trademark infringement. They haven't infringed your mark yet. They're, they're just saying we may infringe your mark because they filed an intent to use application. So um, so that's a, a time where the it, until that use has started, until they've perfected their um, intent to use application, you would really only be looking at the board. Um, that doesn't mean you need to oppose, right? That that's your only option. Eventually the use is going to happen. And maybe then, you know, you're you're going to say, well, wait, and we'll file a district court action or we'll oppose and then stay the opposition before the board and just pursue the case in the district court. There's lots of options for you and there's lots of strategic considerations. Um, and I'd say that I spend, if, if when looking at these factors, it should never be a knee jerk reaction. You really need to evaluate what is the party doing that you have a concern about? Do they have an application? Is it in use? What does my client hope to get out of this? And I would say spend a lot of time there because um, we get caught up in, especially if you're a litigator in district court and you're, you know, before the TTAB, you, you can get caught up in like, we need to stop their use, but the client may be okay with the use in the marketplace. They're just not okay with the registration because it's a broad filing. So you really need to look and evaluate what is my relief what, what options do I have for relief between the board and the district court? And what is my what is my client's concerns? And then I would say that um, the last piece of it would be taking a look as a practitioner and saying, okay, we know what the client wants and we know what the, the facts are here. Um, is this a really sticky trademark issue that would be best decided before a panel of trademark experts like Linda, um, or in a district court or state court where you really don't know what experience the judge have, you know, the judges have in trademark matters. So if you have a really sticky, complex trademark issues, of which if you're a trademark practitioner, there are many. Um, then it may be in your best interest to start at least before the board, even if eventually you may end up in court. So there's a lot of considerations there, but I think to start is what what are your options and what is your client's goals at the end of the day? And, um, you know, like I said, there's not also one, there's not one size fits all and, and both options can be available to you and you can utilize both by preserving rights before the board and then filing a stay of that proceeding and going to the court. So, um, you know, there's a lot of considerations. I think we'll talk through a little bit more of them today, but just to sort of set the stage here. I think when we were talking about this issue um, before about what jurisdiction to move forward in, Linda, I think you made the point about um, the TTAB being a jurisdiction that determines registrability. And, and that's, a, I find that hard, that word really hard to say. So if I didn't get all my <laughs> syllables out there, please pardon me. Linda, can you say what you meant by that? Well, um, it, it's basically what Michelle said. We the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board determined, you know, whether or not um, the trademark is entitled to be registered 
or the other scenario is whether that registration that a client, I mean, that a client or a party got is entitled to um, continue on the register. Those are basically the two, the two ways of, of looking at it. Great, thank you. I think that really helps to, to boil it down. Um, I know that um, you were also talking about, Michelle, the intent to use in commerce and that, you know, potentially your options are limited if there's only the intent to use in commerce. Um, and this plays directly into standing. And so with that, Corinne, I wanted to ask you specifically, I know that there is um, was a recent case about standing in the TTAB um, that you have some notes to talk about. So I'd like to turn it over to you for that. Absolutely. Um, so not just any consumer who buys a product has the standing to oppose the registration of a trademark. Uh, Sam, if you could put up the first curtain slide kind of so we have a, an outline of where to go. So the opposer in this case, who was a uh, professor actually a, of trademark law, so an expert and definitely in some regard, who purchased Rapunzel toys and dolls for her daughter starting in, I believe it was around 2015. And uh, the professor, the opposer found these products by searching Rapunzel on like you go on Google and you search Rapunzel toy and find something like that for her child. So. Uh, the opposer United or the applicant for this case, someone called United Trademark Holdings, sought to register the uh, term Rapunzel for dolls and toy figures. And the professor, the opposer, I'm sorry, I don't know her name, so I'm going to keep calling her opposer or professor, um, did not, uh, she did not jive with this. Um, she was concerned, she opposed, filed an, uh, an opposition at the TTAB and argued that uh, Rapunzel does not indicate the source of a good um, at as well as at the same time, it is also generic or merely descriptive of Rapunzel related goods. Um, she also had a fraud claim in there, which I'm not going to get into because that's a little more complicated than we need right now. Um, but she, the opposer expressed concerns that uh, this would chill marketplace competition. People would be unable to create Rapunzel toys because uh, if this were to be registered. So the opposer claimed that she was entitled to oppose this mark, um, which unfortunately was not the case for her. Um, so with regards to standing in front of the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, Sam, if you could go to the next slide. Um, opposers are limited in when they're able to have standing in front of the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. So they may oppose, they may oppose an application when doing so is within the zones of interest protected by the statute as well as a reasonable belief in damage proximately caused by the registration, which in this case would be the registration of the Rapunzel mark. So the plaintiff needs to allege an injury to a commercial interest in reputation or in sales in order to successfully claim that they have standing. And this unfortunately was not the case for the professor, which one would think she may have known as a trademark law professor, but that's beside the point. Um, so standing as described in the Lexmark Supreme Court case that predated this, um, requires that you be able to show a commercial interest or in reputation or in sales. And the opposer, unfortunately, was not able to show either of these things. She could not establish or allege for that matter that the injury, that, that, that she would be injured in a way that would give her standing in front of the trademark trial and appeal board. So put simply, the Trademark Act doesn't entitle mere consumers to a statutory cause of action. A uh, statutory cause of action is reserved for those with a uh, commercial interest um, and at this, at something else that was an issue in this case, why she was unsuccessful, was that her alleged belief in damage was too speculative. It was too remote. It was not concrete enough where she could say, this is how this registration would damage me and the products that I'm selling or the services that I'm trying to distribute. So not just anybody can come before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board and oppose an application, which is something to keep in mind. Thanks so much, Corinne. So um, we've heard a little bit about why you would go to the TTAB um, and who can go to the TTAB. So with that, Linda, um, I'd like to ask you to tell us a little bit about, you know, what is the general framework of the TTAB? What does the TTAB proceeding look like? Um, and then we'll dive in specifically on these points, because I know this is what people really want to hear about. What do you see go wrong and go right in, in those processes? But let's start with the general first. Okay. Generally, um, a TTAB proceeding is some is very similar to a, uh, a civil action in, in district court. 
You start off with the pleadings where the parties, you know, are stating their issues. You go into a discovery period that's followed by um, something that's called the testimony period, which is the equivalent of trial, where the parties are putting in their evidence. After that, after the trial period, you go into um, the briefing period where each party submits a brief. Um, it's kind of, um, the proceeding is like a hybrid proceeding between a trial court action and, and an appellate court action because the parties are briefing the case. And after the briefs are filed, the parties can um, request oral hearing. It's not required that you um, appear at an oral hearing, but the parties can request it. And then after that, it's um, decided, um, you know, put before the board for making a decision. Once a decision is made, um, the party has a couple choices. Number one, they can always file right away with an appeal with the federal circuit, or they can request reconsideration by the board first and see if they can get the board to change um, their mind or if they feel they have to present um, a reason why to support um, the reconsideration. So if they show the board made an error of some sort, um, that will that may turn out in their favor. And after the request for reconsideration, if they're not successful, they can either appeal to the federal circuit directly on appeal, or they can file a brand new case at the district court. And then when you go to the district court, it's like a whole new ball game. You still have your trademark trial and appeal board case, but now you can also bring in new claims and add new evidence and, and proceed on that count. Um, so going back to um, uh, the, the general framework, um, you said you've mentioned a trial, you've mentioned it's like district court litigation, but um, is this a case where there's the written record is really what's going to govern? I mean, is there an actual trial in this case? Because, you know, when, well, when you say trial to a litigator, we, we think of something very specific. <laughs> um, the trial period is, is really the period of time where the parties are um, putting in their evidence. And it is, you're right, it's all on a written record. Um, so the parties file either the transcripts of testimony depositions. So if you have witnesses, you have to take a testimony deposition and submit that transcript. Or more frequently now, because um, the rules changed a few years ago, where parties can introduce testimony in the form of declarations or affidavits. So um, most parties, you know, submit a declaration of this, their witnesses together with any um, exhibits that go with it. And then there's another um, area that um, for documents that parties want to submit that can be submitted by a notice of reliance where you don't need a person's um, testimony to get it into evidence. Those kind of documents are um, copies of registrations, of printed publications, of official government records, um, an adverse party's answer to the interrogatories, and um, items from the internet. So um, when you have items from the internet, um, they can just be automatically filed. No one has to testify to support their entry into evidence. Um, the only thing you need to do is make sure you identify the date that that material was downloaded and what website it was downloaded from. Without that, the evidence won't be considered. Um, so that's the good part of internet evidence. The, the part that parties have to be aware of though is that internet evidence is only admissible for what it's showing on its face. So it's not proof of what is stated in the article that someone submits. Because for that purpose, it's just hearsay. But parties get a in a little bit of trouble sometimes because if the plaintiff, I'm sorry, if the party doesn't object to the admissibility of internet evidence that the opposing party submitted, 
And what happens is the opposing party is going to submit it to show the truth of the matter asserted. If the other party doesn't object, it may very well come into the record and be used to argue the truth of the matter asserted. So the party that's on the other end of the internet evidence needs to make sure to raise the objection to the admissibility of the internet evidence on the merits of that um, evidence. Great, um, thank you. Are there other issues specifically, because this is something I don't think that we deal with quite as much in terms of general litigation, other tips or do's or don'ts in connection with internet evidence? Um, I mean, primarily the problems that, that come up frequently are the internet evidence doesn't have the appropriate, um, call it verification information. There's no indication of the date or the website it came from. I, frequently, parties introduce it that way. And that's, that's mm -hmm. a big problem. Um, and and the other the other big area that comes up with internet evidence is the party who introduces it tries to rely on it for the truth of the matter of what is in the article, but it it's not admissible for that because normally the other party is objecting to it on that grounds. So those are the two big areas that it gets tripped up. Great parties get tripped up on. Yeah. And then with respect to the trial period, um, you mentioned that that involves taking testimony and you were also talking about submitting declarations at the same time. Do you find now that parties are taking less testimony since they have the opportunity um, to provide testimony to the tribunal in the way of declarations? Or what does that look like and what, what thoughts do you have on best practices? I would say yeah, there's significantly less, I can't even call it live testimony because even before it was um, uh, testimony depositions that were filed. So today, um, I would say almost everyone files a declaration or affidavit. That's how they introduce um, witness testimony. Um, it's kind of a, interesting circumstance because a lot of times it sounds like the lawyer wrote it and I know the lawyer wrote it um <laughs> and you know there's been discussions about that and some people are you know some judges are more concerned about that than others but um you know if the other party doesn't object to it uh, then the board just considers it you know um in the manner that they deem appropriate, you know, how, how credible it, it is the uh, testimony that's set forth in the affidavit. So um, generally it, it's working very well and it's certainly much, much cheaper for parties to um, submit it that way. Well, maybe the expense might not be that much difference, but at least um, I think the lawyers uh, are more comfortable because they know what what's being testified to by their witness. Yeah. So, do you find that lawyers are actually taking less testimony then, so far as you can tell, during the trial period? Oh, I'd say there's no question. Wow. There's no okay. Question. Interesting. Great. There's still, excuse me. There's still depth. There is, there is a period before the the trial or the testimony period, the discovery period. And there, there's many depositions taken by the lawyers. Oh, understood. Okay, so yeah. you're really talking about the trial period more specifically. Right. Okay, right. yeah, great. Um, so um, we've talked about evidence, taking of evidence, the notice of reliance a little bit and the trial period. Um, I wanna talk about briefing just a little bit and ask you about that. How critical is the briefing in this process in your view? Well, I think the briefing is really the key to a party's case, provided that they have the evidence in the record and the case law to support it. Um, you know, what kinds of things that attorneys might, um, you know, screw up on in, in the briefing process is um, they'll attach uh, documents to their brief. I mean, don't bother doing that because it's not going to get looked at. The only exception might be um, um, 
you know, if it's a judicial notice type of evidence, that could be okay to attach to a brief, but anything else is not going to get looked at at all. And it's not proper to attach it to the brief. Um, another area that's interesting is um, the citation of cases. Um, one thing is commonly people cite to a case and never cite to the page of the case, you know, that has the discussion in it that they are referring to. Um, to me, this is almost first year law school, um, um, a subject that everyone had already, but I guess some people forget. But <laughs> it takes a lot of time when you're the judge and you're reviewing a lot of the cases and you have to read them all, every, every single page of it to find it. it. It's frustrating about that. So please try to remember to insert the page sites. Um, another thing that comes up is because the Trademark Child and Appeal Board has come out and said that um, people can cite to the cases, the TTAB cases that are not precedential. The problem that comes up though is when people are citing TTAB cases in their briefs, the sites look all the same. So if you're reading the briefs as a judge, like before the, the oral hearing, for example, you don't know necessarily if the cases that are cited are all precedential decisions or if some of them are not precedential. So I think what people need to do is insert the little parenthetical after a case that's not precedential that says, you know, the case title and um, the site and then parentheses not precedential so that the board knows already right off the bat. Um, but then again, if you read the, um, the trademark um, board, uh, the manual of procedure, um, right there, it says the board discourages even citing non-precedential decisions. Although in the one case, it may be helpful to cite a non-precedential decision is if there's a case that's very factually similar to the, the facts in your case, then I think the judges may pay more attention to that decision. Um, but other than that, it's not, you don't get much out of citing a non-precedential case, but people do it more and more lately I've seen. And the last point I wanna talk about is the citation of cases. Again, the Trademark Board Manual of Procedure says that the sites to TTAB decisions needs to be the USPQ site. But today, almost everything I read from parties doesn't cite to a USPQ site. It cites to Westlaw or um, to Lexis. I can understand why, because they probably don't have USPQ. But um, that's what the, the, the manual of procedure says you need to cite to is the USPQ site. And I think it, it would be helpful to everyone if it at least the parties would cite the USPQ site and then cite your Westlaw site or your um, Lexus site. That's fine. Um, but the rules are you're supposed to cite the USPQ site. So whatever and that means. Linda, does it make it harder on the judges when you don't have the USPQ site um, accessible? Well, it, it depends on what, um, what method the judge uses. If right. the judge uses the USPQ, it's, it's more difficult. If, you use Le if they're using Lexis and the sites are in um, Westlaw, that's not helpful, and, or the other way around. If you cite Westlaw and the judge uses Lexis, that's not helpful. That's why, in my mind, I thought USPQ always made sense. but. It's confusing nowadays because sometimes parties file things and they're citing um, Lexis and firms might not subscribe to Lexis. So I guess you just have to search the case name in whatever database you're using. It just, it, it makes for a lot more work. 
Yeah. So it sounds like one, one takeaway, I think you've said now several times is, is really it, it it's what's in the rules, right? So it's, it's time to go back to the rules and actually follow the process um, that the TTAB has, has put in, in place there. I think that's a, a big takeaway since, since it sounds like everything you've talked about is actually, it's in the rules, right? Right. And by the way, um, that's not an official statement of the trademark trial and appeal. Understood. Board, I yes. <laughs> Yes, understood. So um, I want to go to, um, I, I know we're going to talk a little bit about oral hearing as well, but I want to go down to um, a, a different question because um, what you've what you've talked about raises um, a, a question in my mind as to how many of the issues you're talking about have to do with the fact that you may be dealing with practitioners who are not always in front of the TTAB. They're usually in federal district court or somewhere else. And so they may find it difficult to pivot to a different a different forum. Um, so, I, Michelle, I want to ask you this question too. So, Michelle or Linda, I don't care which one of you goes first, but um, it, you know, so when we have people who aren't practicing in the TTAB as often as other places, what do you see them doing wrong? Um, what what mistakes are they are they do they fall for just based on the the lack of familiarity? I'm happy to start. Um, I think that it's similar to what Linda said, which is um, that the TTAB rules are different than the federal rules of civil procedure. And some they're similar, but they're different in, in important ways. Um, no live testimony is a big one. And if you don't recognize that, if you're used to being in district court um, and you're used to live testimony and trials, it's important for you to know at the front end of the case what evidence you're going to submit in support of your case and how to get it in. So um, there's, you know, Linda's gone through some of the ways that you can get things in. Um, and it's important to have that roadmap at the front end of your case. So you're not caught on your heels later. And um, particularly because the board, you know, they have, they feel like they get I won't put words into Linda's mouth, but um, they feel like they give appropriate and you know, reasonable amount of time in discovery and in responses and in their in their TTB case management um, rules that they're not very um, open to like if, if you're late on filing responses to something or you serve discovery on the last day of discovery and then you're taking issue with some of the responses, the board is not. Um, is not patient in that way because they've provided, they've outlined everything for you on the front end. So I think that one of the traps you can get caught into is that if you're not used to litigating it, you'll just kind of fall into the assumption that um, it falls into you know the, the federal rules of civil procedure and the way the trial works. And it's just, it's not like that. But the, at the same time, I find that there are so many amazing resources available for figuring out what you need to do before the board. So, you know, there's the trademark board manual, you know, procedures, as Linda mentioned. Um, there's also great treatise material out there. There's great articles out there on, um, you know, managing your case before the TTAB. So it's not, it, it doesn't take too much effort and the effort is so valuable on the front end to know where you're going in the case. Um, the other things that I would say is just that to be you know, cognizant of the fact that the judge isn't going to be setting the deadlines. Like in trial court, you know, file a motion, you might get you know something from the judge that says, okay, your response is due this date, a hearing is this date. That's all set by case management deadlines. And so you need to understand how to count days, how to read the rules. And, and there's, again, a lot of good resources and case sites, even within the um, TBMP, the board manual procedure on, on examples of how to, how to do that. So um, I guess I would just say to know, to we've sort of, I guess that that's one of our takeaways, right, is to read the rules um, consistently and continuously, even if you've been practicing a lot. I mean, the, the rules, there are different interpretations of the rules as you know other cases come before them and it, you know interesting fact patterns and it's important to always go back to the rules. So um, I think that if you're used to practicing in district court, the TTAB is 
not so different in some ways, but can be very different in important ways. Right, I, I, I agree um, with everything Michelle said. And um, the one, the two situations where it gets a little um, complicated is when you have pro se parties or really inexperienced um, attorneys who are, are not even that familiar with trademark law, much less before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, because everything Michelle just talked about is really foreign to them. And um, that causes a lot of uh, headaches. And um, it's probably um, one, of the, one of the major things behind um, the Trademark um, Trial and Appeal Board coming out with a final pre-trial conference order program recently. Um, and it's in, it's in the pilot stages right now, but it was designed by the judges and the interlocutory attorneys um, to really facilitate an effective and um, efficient um, way to conduct the trials for the, both the benefit of the parties and the board. Um, and to right now they're designating or picking out cases to go into this pilot program for a final pretrial conference order. And they look at cases that have, um, cases that are likely to have a lot of um, large unfocused records. Now how they determine exactly that, I'm not sure. But I think by the, by the prior conduct of the parties, um, they have some idea of how that, what it's going to look like at the evidentiary stage. Um, like if, if the early proceeding has also been overly contentious um, or, or there's a lot of contested motions, those are cases that would be looked at to go into a final pre-conference um, order. Um, if the parties or the council are, are, are not familiar with the, trademark boards practice, that's definitely a situation where they're gonna look at um, putting you in the final pre-trial conference um, order situation. Or if there's a large number of claims or defenses that don't seem to be well-grounded or unlikely to be pursued, that probably will end up being a candidate to go into the final pre-trial conference program. And I can just quickly summarize the program. And that is first the parties meet and they have their pre-trial conference where they designate evidence that they're gonna put in through a notice of reliance, um, a list of all the testimony and exhibits, and they have to state the objections to the other party's evidence. And then the parties prepare a um, uh, the pre-trial conference order and the TTAB has um, prepared a proposed template for the parties to use. And you have to set forth your trial plan, any issues, your anticipated witnesses, your exhibits, your, um, the proposed defense and any claim amendments and objections to the evidence. And then there's a final conference with a judge and an interlocutory attorney that oversees the final pretrial conference and the final pretrial conference, I mean, the final trial conference order. And um, the question that people ask is, is that judge that's involved in the, in the, in the final pretrial conference order, is that judge on the panel of judges that decides the case? And they are not. There's different judges that are going to hear the case. Um, so the initial thoughts so far about this, um, you know, some parties are concerned that it just adds to the cost of the proceeding. And it's a little um, of concern for them because part of the reason why some parties go to the TTAB first is because it's known for being less expensive than going into, you know, a, um, a district court. And on the other side, um, it can be very frustrating for firms, I mean, for especially the experienced firms when they have a pro se party on the other side of the case. So the, the final pre-trial conference order could help organize that case and make it um, easier for the other side to um, um, 
you know, respond and take their part in the case. So, um, it's, so it's so new that there's nothing really concrete about how the results are looking right now. So Linda, we don't know yet whether that's going to be something that will be adopted for all cases. This is just something that's being tried out right now. Right, right. Okay. Right. Great. So going back to something Michelle was talking about um, with respect to the deadlines and so on, um, you know, in, in district court, when we have deadlines and, and we blow our deadlines, I'll just say we blow our deadlines. Of course, I've never blown a deadline just for the record. <laughs> um, we can usually throw ourselves on the mercy of, you know, opposing counsel or especially on the mercy of the court and resurrect, you know, and cure the situation one way or the other. Um, is that something that's not, it's it's just not possible in, in the TTAB? I mean, you're, you're, you're going to be stuck with those deadlines. There's, there's really no give and take there if you haven't asked for the extra time in a timely fashion. No, I mean, parties frequently file motions on maybe the last day that they could be filed. That's very common. Sometimes even a couple days after sometimes a couple of weeks after. And it really depends on the circumstances. I mean, sometimes um, uh, some motions have a lot more um, considerations to think about than others do. So, I mean, you're, you're not totally out in the cold, but you better have a darn good reason. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, has it been your experience that there's less lenience in, in front of the TTAB? Also having never missed or come close to missing. <laughs> Deborah, I can't. We're only that. talking about opposing Obviously counsel. Obviously hypothetical, but no. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think that a lot of exactly my experiences with what, what Linda said, and mostly it's, it's also in researching that type of stuff is that um, there are there is some leniency, yes, because typically there's some there's some extraordinary circumstances. But where there's been less, there the board has been more strict, um, and you can see this just in their guidelines is in your service of discovery. If you're serving discovery on the last day of discovery, and then you're you know having issues with the substance and the, the responsiveness or the the um content coming back as responses to your discovery the board has less leniency and linda can correct me if i'm wrong because you waited to the last day and they said you know if you wanted to you know you waited till the last day to serve it and that's not enough time and so um there's you know the i now you need to serve it, you know, far in advance of the end of discovery. Um, and so they've created rules now to put, I think, some structure in place. And again, I'll give Linda a chance to comment on that. But so that you're now forced to, you know, when I began practicing, serving on the last day of discovery was an acceptable part of your practice. That's not the case before the board now. There, you know, you, you have deadlines by which you must serve discovery um, before the end of discovery. Right. That, that's the one thing I was going to mention, but you covered it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's good, too. I mean, puts you know, gives it, um, it goes to my first point, which is being in like having to look in advance how you're going to prove your case and looking ahead at all the deadlines and how you're going to get that stuff in and not waiting to the last minute to do so. Right. So we just got a really interesting question that I want to know the answer to, and that is whether it is worth filing summary judgment in the TTAB. I love that question. <laughs> well, I mean, first, let me say um, the vast majority of summary judgment motions are denied. <laughs> um, but I also know that parties have sometimes um, underlying reasons for filing the summary judgment motions to find out um, if there's um, an issue regarding something, you know, to kind of get it cemented that they have to pursue further discovery or not on certain matters. Um, but for the most part, um, it usually doesn't take a lot for the interlocutory attorneys to um, find a reason to deny the, the summary judgment motion. So 
Great. So let's talk about um, oral. I want to go to oral hearing, the oral hearing um, briefly, and just hear your thoughts. Um, when you think it's worthwhile requesting oral oral argument and when it's it's not um, worthwhile seeking an oral, oral hearing. Um, right. Linda, you want to start and then Michelle, if you want to weigh in on that. Okay. Well, first of all, if if you think there's a real need to educate the board about your your uh, clients' products or services, and and certainly um, some of the products and services today are complicated to people who are not involved in that particular industry. Um, so that may be a good reason why you want to have a hearing just to make sure you explain it. Um, or if your case is legally or factually um, complicated, it would be, um, it may be worthwhile to, to have a hearing. Um, but certainly in a lot of cases, an oral hearing is not necessary. Um, the party's positions are, um, you know, set forth in their briefs and the case can be decided and the oral hearing didn't really um, lend anything additional. Um, so, you know, I would just say that just tells me the importance of the briefing. It just underscores it one more time, how important putting the briefs in and making them together and complete, because that's really um, what's going to um, play the, the major role in deciding the case. But again, if you have these other outside issues, where you think it would definitely be helpful. You know, it's not that you have clothing and the other person has restaurant services. Well, everyone understands those kinds of goods and services, but some of the, um, you know, software, so much has been done in the software realm that it's, it's confusing sometimes. And the way that the services are described, it's hard to even understand. Um, some of the descriptions that are in the applications. So in a situation like that, I think it would be very helpful um, to just give some education to the board so that they're more comfortable um, when it comes time to um, write the decision and decide the case. Linda, we had someone come up with a question um, and we haven't touched on survey evidence at all. And I think this relates also a little bit to what you're saying in terms of the complexity and how to deal with that. When, in what circumstances do you find survey evidence? Does, do judges tend to, and I know I don't speak for everyone, <laughs> might it be, might, might survey evidence be helpful? Well, I mean, survey evidence is helpful if the survey is done in the correct manner but most cases I see um there's always they always find points to be very very critical hmm. of certain aspects of the survey so I think council really has to <clears throat> kind of have to juggle you know the benefits of the survey with any possible issues regarding you know what the deficiency may be in a survey because I don't think there's going to be ever a survey that's perfectly conducted on all aspects. And I may be wrong. I haven't seen every survey. In a lot of cases at the board, there are no surveys. Um, you know, surveys can be very good in, um, you know, merely descriptive cases, generic cases, likelihood of confusion cases. I mean, they definitely can be helpful, but you really have to be sure you have an expert um, who, who's good and very familiar with conducting a survey. And I would, um, you know, search through the TTAB decisions and see if this person has been um, involved in a case and has, you know, where their survey has been um, addressed in a decision of the TTAB or a, or a district court. So you get more comfortable um, with their abilities. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, great advice. 
So with that, I'd like to turn back to you, Corinne. Um, we've been talking about um, these inter-parties proceedings, something that looks a little more like litigation. Um, and I, But I know you have a pair of cases to discuss that have to do with, um, on the ex parte side, that have to do with the standard for inherent distinctiveness. So would you like to dig into those? I would. Um, so the first case here is In Ray Seminole Tribe of Florida. And uh, as a little bit of background, the in inherently distinctive is a, is a term of art. Um, basically, it means a trademark that quickly and clearly identifies the proprietor, the seller, as the source of the goods or services. Um, so basically, you see a trademark, you know immediately who is providing the goods or services. Um, and customers um, immediately rely on the trade dress to distinguish your services from other services so they can compare where these are coming from. And this case here, the applicant, uh, which was the Seminole Tribe of Florida, wanted to register the guitar building design you'll see on your right um, for a hard rock hotel. And the examining attorney refused registration, saying that this was uh, not dis non-distinctive and failed to act as a trademark. Um, and service, service marks and trademarks serve similar purposes. But for those of you who don't know, a service mark is uh, a name symbol uh, design or combination of those that is used to identify or distinguish uh, the services that one person, such as hotel services in this case, uh, from another person's hotel services, such as the Hilton, as opposed to the Hard Rock. Then the Seminole tribe uh, appealed this case, and Sam, I'm gonna have you flip to the next slide for this one. And the TTAB refused, re reversed, <laughs> this is always so hard to say, reversed the refusal and found the mark on the right inherently distinctive. And so to get to this finding, we actually have to go into two more cases within cases, which is always fun, um, finding that this was uh, inherently distinctive. And the, in the Seminole Tribe's argument, they brought up the Two Pesos case and the Samara Brothers case. So in Two Pesos, uh, it was a Mexican restaurant that had very distinctive um, trade dress. So whenever I'm trying to explain trade dress to someone, I think of the Cheesecake Factory because you walk into a Cheesecake Factory, you know where you are. You could be brought there blindfolded and they'll unblindfold you and you know it's a Cheesecake <laughs> Factory without ever seeing those words. Um, and so Two Pesos had this really fun neon design and um, the way that it looked, which is very distinctive. And another Mexican restaurant copied this design and two pesos sue um, based on their unique trade dress. So the trade dress in this case was sufficiently unique to uh, be considered inherently distinctive, as we've discussed earlier. So um, the, there was no need to show secondary meaning. But uh, the other case that was mentioned in, uh, in Ray Seminole was the Samara Brothers case, where the distinction that was relevant here was product packaging, which is one kind of trade dress. Um, or also known as, and my Latin is rusty because I took it in high school, tertium quid. Uh, I don't know if that's right. And no one can tell me otherwise <laughs> um, because nope, they don't speak can't. Latin anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's also product design packaging. So coming back to In Ray Seminole, um, the guitar shaped hotel here was akin to product packaging or tertium quid um, trade dress. And the board focused on the uniqueness of the trade dress at issue here, the guitar shaped hotel. Um, this saying that which was quite unusual. There was no other record of any other guitar shaped hotel here, which helped the board to find that consumers would immediately recognize, uh, rely on the guitar shape to recognize that this is a hard rock casino and hotel. Um, and they were successful in getting this registered. Now on the other side of this very same inherently distinctive coin is In Re Palacio del Rio, which I know I didn't pronounce right because I never took Spanish, I took Latin. <laughs> So the applicant here, the Hilton, tried to register the design on the right, this fun group of rectangles, um, uh, as a trademark in the same, or as trade dress in a similar manner as the Seminole tribe. Um, and the TTAB uh, affirmed the refusal of the registration for similar reasons discussed in, in Ray Seminole. Um, as we discussed there, the inherently distinctive trade dress is capable of identifying uh, products or services as coming from a specific source. So in, in Ray Seminole, you could tell that it was coming from the hard rock because of the guitar shape. So uh, Palacio used the same principles from Walmart and Smart Bros to try and argue that their um, trade dress was distinctive. And the TTAB conducted an analysis using something called the Seabrook factors, um, of which there are four to determine whether or not this trade dress was inherently distinctive. 
And so those four factors are whether the proposed trade, the proposed marks can constitute a common shape or design, whether the proposed marks are unique or unusual in the field in which they're used, as in you don't typically see them like a guitar, whether the proposed marks are a mere refinement of a commonly adopted and well-known form of ornamentation, and whether the proposed marks are capable of creating a commercial impression distinct from the words that would go along with the trade dress. So those are the four factors that were at play um, in the In Re Palacio uh, Del Rio case. And so the examining attorney made of record a lot of evidence of similar looking hotels, much to um, Hilton's chagrin. Sam, if you could flip to the next uh, slides, you can see some of those hotels. So you'll see on the right side that there are a lot of rectangular modular hotels because it's a helpful shape when you want to put people in them <laughs> because you can just walk in like if you were inside of a sphere, things might get a little dicey. Um, so they, uh, the, the Hilton also argued that um, the building design was distinctive and that it was unique and unlike any other in the world. Uh, their source for this was Wikipedia, which I don't know a lot about <laughs> citing things in front of the TTAV quite yet, but I don't know if Wikipedia is the best source for that. Um, and the applicant also provided four declarations from customers supporting Hilton's argument that the hotel had a unique exterior. Um, shocker, the TTAB did not buy this. Um, then also these declarations were almost identical. They were pretty cookie cutter. Everyone said the same thing. Um, and this was not very persuasive to the TTAB. So overall, um, the, they found that the, the hotel shape here was not inherently distinctive and Hilton wasn't able to show that its building design uh, had an acquired distinctiveness. So nothing about the, the hotel that we showed you on the last slide uh, screams Hilton without having Hilton emblazoned on there. So those were two cases with essentially not the same facts, but very similar facts, very similar law that came out uh, very differently. So, yeah. On the and same day. Uh, yes, on the same day, which is so <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Thank you, Corinne. So I have one final question. Linda knows this one's coming. Um, and we've got, you know, 30 seconds really for this last question. So Corinne had some help deciding these cases and Linda actually picked these out for her. And so my question to Linda is, Linda, why did you choose these cases and 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 not something like the, the Jack Daniels? What did what, what did you hope people would learn out of those today that they couldn't learn from talking about Jack Daniels? Well, I, I just thought the two building cases are were interesting and it makes us more aware of what a trademark really is mm. because trademarks go beyond just word marks. A lot of things are trademarks and we probably don't even realize that they're trademarks. Like, um, you know, packaging, the Coca-Cola bottle is a very old trademark. In fact, I don't know now if it's still, oh yeah, they still sell it once in a while in, in actual bottles, but they probably do that to make sure they still have their trademark. Or um, product, like the Weber kettle-shaped grills is registered as a trademark. Colors, um, the brown for UPS delivery services. Um, um, Smells or scents are even registered. There's one registered for some sewing thread. So there's a lot of things that we kind of take for granted now, but these people are getting the ability to register it and get some real rights that are easy to enforce. Now, that's not to say the Jack Daniels case is not important. It's a very interesting case, <laughs> but it just doesn't involve the registrability of, of a trademark. It dealt with the infringement of the Jack Daniels um, trademark and trade dress. Um, it, it's an interesting case. The Supreme Court came down with a pretty narrow holding. I think it just said that when the alleged infringer, when it uses a trademark, that's when it uses the trademark as a designation of source. So it uses the someone else's trademark as a trademark. The Rogers test is not going to apply. So. Um, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people thought the Rogers test should apply, but the Supreme Court said, well, the Rogers test really only applies in narrow situations too. It applies to those cases involving a non-trademark use of someone's trademark. They gave some examples like um, Mattel had sued a band over using the name, the, the Barbie Girl song, and, and there the Rogers test was applied because the band's use of the Barbie name was not as a source identifier. It didn't refer to um, the song's origin. 
or um, they said, what would someone think when they heard Janis Joplin singing, oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? I mean, no one would think that, um, you know, Mercedes Benz and Janis Joplin were had some kind of joint venture. Um, but in this Jack Daniels case, the court, you know, found that um, there it could be a, a trademark use, but the case has actually been remanded. So I think, you know, we'll hear more about it unless they settle. <laughs> Well, thank you, Linda. I appreciate that very much. We just got kudos for not using the Jack Daniels case, although I think you probably said a lot about it. So <laughs> I think people got their Jack Daniels review too. So um, I, I know we've gone over by a few minutes. Thank you, everybody, for sticking in. And, and thanks so much um, for joining us today um, to, dis to discuss these important topics. I know I learned a lot. I hope you all did too.